Thank you, uh, Simon, and welcome to the Vien Public to this uh, second episode of the Code Red TV podcast on uh, the the issue of uh, wanting some change in terms of the trauma that members of the Black community experience uh, as a consequence of their interaction with the police. Uh, my name is Calvin Wilson, the founder of uh, Code Red TV and this podcast. Um, and today we are going to be talking about three themes. Uh, we're going to be talking about a uh, Black History Month and uh, a recap as to what it meant to us, what transpired in the Thames Valley community uh, uh, last month. We are also going to be talking about the Thames Valley Police Independent Oversight Scrutiny um, board. I should say that again, Independent Scrutiny Oversight Board. And uh, we've just been formed a month ago. Um, and what we're required to do is to um, scrutinize, monitor the police in terms of its fully implementing the race action plan. Um, we are following the national example um, because what we are trying to do is to strengthen or en and enhance the trust and confidence that uh, the Black uh, BAME, Black Asian minority ethnic community has in the police. Um, and importantly also, we are trying to ensure that the police hold themselves to the high standards that uh, they are required to do in terms of uh, serving members of the public. So today, we have three important guests. First, DC Detective Constable uh, Yvonne Newman from the Thames Valley Police. We also have um, Assistant Chief Constable Dennis Murray, also from the Thames Valley Police. And uh, far away in Wales, we have Josh Stunnel. Um, how should I say, working in the field, uh, the founder of Be The Change, an organization which canvasses all of the issues that we are going to be discussing tonight. Um, and I know he does a lot of work with the uh, uh, Devon and Cornwall Police. And so he brings, as does Yvonne and uh, Dennis, a rich field of uh, experience um, and expertise to this discussion. So without further ado, because I know we have an hour, but the hour would go very fast. So can I ask uh, ladies first, we'll ask DC Newman to introduce herself, give us a, an idea as to your background and uh, you know why you're connected to this podcast. And then we'll talk to Dennis and then Josh. Yvonne, the floor is yours. Hello there. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me, Calvin, uh, to this. So as you said, yes, my name is Yvonne. I am a police officer and I have been for up to for, for, the, for 14 years now. Uh, I'm based at Reading Police Station and I currently work in the Central Fraud Unit. I have been an active member of our support association for minority ethnic officers uh, in Thames Valley Police. Our association is called SAME and SAME stands for Support Association for Minority Ethnic Officers. I've been active, as I've said, uh, because I'm really passionate about policing. I believe it is my calling in life to be a police officer, to serve. But um, having joined, I've come to the um, realization that I am that role model for young black uh, female females, such as my two daughters. In the absence of other role models, I found I had to be that role model for my children. Uh, I met Calvin. Yes, continue, continue. I'm sorry, I'm I was sorry going... for interrupting you. Continue. <laughs> I was going to go into how we met, uh, which yes. was at the Black History Month event that Thames Valley uh, Police uh, ran with support from SAME, our support association, on the 25th of November uh, and um, was invited to come here today. Thank you. And I'm very pleased that you're here, and I know you have a lot of uh, information to share. Uh, next, we go to Assistant Chief Constable Dennis Murray. Dennis, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. I'm Assistant Chief Constable Dennis Murray, and uh, I 
lead on the race action plan for Thames Valley Police. I'm also the lead for crime and criminal justice. Uh, I'm the se most senior ranking uh, Asian officer in Thames Valley Police. Uh, I was the same at the British Transport Police and before that Northamptonshire Police, uh, having led on various elements of the race plan and use of powers for those forces. I'm in my 32nd year of service and looking forward to the discussions this evening with you all. Thank you very much, Dennis. And now, uh, last but certainly not least, Josh Stunnell. Josh, can I ask you to introduce yourself and uh, tell us uh, why you're connected to this podcast? Yeah, hi everyone. So yeah, Josh Stunnell, I'm the founder and CEO of an organization called Be The Change. And we work with over a thousand people a year covering the South West and South Wales of people who are either at risk of entering the criminal justice system or those who are in the criminal justice system. And we run programs within six prisons, transition programs, um, resettlement programs, uh, covering the male and female estate. Um, a large part of our work now is also getting into, into system change, um, particularly uh, supporting issues around individuals from ethnic minority backgrounds and that might be some of the systems and procedures that are, that are in place within either the, 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 the prison setting or um, the police setting or the court settings. In addition I also sit on um, some additional scrutiny panels uh, particularly looking at uh, stop and search and, and use of force. Um, for me it's it's all around about um, the individuals that, that we work with, things that are really clear, two things that come across all the time, particularly for people from ethnic minority backgrounds, are A, they have no trust in the system, and B, they don't feel they have a voice. Um, and that's why I'm looking to get involved in as many things, as many panels as I can, in order to try and help with some of that moving, moving forward. Thank you. Well, uh, good to hear your background, uh, good to know your dedication to this type of work because uh, the work that needs to be undertaken is vital, it's critical, it's important, um, and it's good that we have dedicated people like yourself, like Yvonne, like Dennis, to, to you know, show the way forward. Um, so as I indicated in the uh, startup, um, you know, we're going to discuss first uh, Black History Month. We are going to do a recap as to uh, last month and uh, uh, what it means to to you and how does it point us as uh, members of the black um, minority minority ethnic community how does the the things that we did last month the theme of you know, time for change action of words how do those words point us into you know our behavior our uh, our advocacy um, for the future. So again, ladies first, um, Yvonne, uh, what uh, does Black History Month mean to you uh, now and for the future? I think you're on, I think you're on mute. Oh, yeah, I think you were on mute. You were muted. So let's Oh, is that better? Uh, brilliant. Sorry about that. Uh, technology isn't my friend. Um, so um, I recently read about how um, there, there's cause to make Black History Month something that happens um, all year round, not just in the month of October. And, and I think that's something that I agree with. So I am of African heritage. I was born and raised in Zimbabwe and I moved to the UK when I was 18 years old. And I am raising two mixed race uh, little girls who um, interestingly are learning, well, my oldest, my 13 year old is learning about um, slave trade. And what she brought home was very surprising to me uh, after her first lesson. And that was, oh, it was black people who enslaved other black people. Um, they were going in, inland from the coastal areas, capturing them, bringing them to the coastal areas where they were then sending them off to uh, slavers. And it's uh, black people 
black on black violence is essentially what my daughter was saying. Uh, so it's interesting. We call for the curriculum to be changed and for children to be taught about black culture and black history. It's now being done. However, the narrative that is being uh, pushed forward is quite different to what my understanding of um, black history, particularly specifically the, the slave trade. That she is right, that is an element of what took place, but that isn't all. Um, so I think it, there's that saying, be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. We are mm. getting it now, are we not? And it's manifesting itself in this way. Mm. Was that a very painful discussion for you and her to have in terms of, you know, the, you know, where it started, the, the slave trade and, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, um, our involvement, uh, if you will, in, in, in this uh, in this industry that uh, is so traumatic or has been so traumatic and continues to be um, traumatic to uh, people all over the world? Absolutely. I realized that my knowledge is very lacking. I didn't have the evidence base. I knew what she was saying wasn't quite, uh, while there was elements of truth to it, it wasn't quite uh, how it, it happened. And she said something that, interestingly, uh, Neil Basu said on the 25th of October, and which was quite a controversial statement when he, 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 he prefaced that statement with the saying, oh, this is going to be quite controversial. And he said, um, black people didn't abolish slavery, white people did. My daughter said similar. And uh, I still don't know how I feel about it. But what I do know is I need to educate myself a hell of a lot more. I've got a very intelligent child, more, much more intelligent and academic than I ever was. And I just didn't have the facts and the knowledge to explain or argue with her. But I knew what she was saying wasn't right. Um, I guess like in policing, I'm constantly finding myself in a position where I know I don't have the facts and figures, for example, stop and search, use of force. I can tell you my own view of it, but there's facts and figures that, you know, say otherwise. Mm. But when mm. you don't have your information, you, you cannot argue. Mm. So looking to the past, we have to empower ourselves with the facts, um, educate Absolutely. ourselves and our children and the wider community as to, you know, what really transpired in the past so that in terms of pointing ourselves to the future, we can do so on a very solid foundation. So can I bring in, bring in Dennis? Dennis, uh, what does uh, Black History Month mean to you? How were you involved yeah, in I mean, the I last, me the last week celebrations? Uh, yeah, I had the privilege of opening up the event, uh, albeit virtually, because I was uh, out of the country. Uh, and what I talked about was that Black History Month is a real opportunity to look at the events of the past uh, learn from it, but also to celebrate from it. I mean, if I look at my personal history, my parents came here from India, uh, having worked on the railways, they came to the UK with a suitcase and nothing else. Uh, and they did that for their children to give them a better life. And here I stand now as a, an assistant chief constable for the fifth largest force in the country. Uh, and have been able to turn that into something positive. And there are lots of those stories all over the U UK, our Prime Minister, our Home Secretary, uh, yes. and, and various bits. And all of that comes from the history that went before us. The fact that people went and tried things and did things and were successful, they failed, uh, in equal measures means that we were able to do what we did because of the people that pioneered and went before us. Uh, but I think it's also an opportunity uh, to help those people that struggle with the concept of Black History Month and how policing has got to the position that it currently is, where there is this tension with the, the members of the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, uh, to understand for officers from all denominations uh, how we actually got here. And when I went with Yvonne to the uh, Black Police Association National Conference, there was two speakers there with, that were absolutely exceptional. And, and actually, a bit like what Yvonne said, when you heard that, that the story they told of how we got to this stage, you sat there and go, I didn't even know that. Um, mm. So trying to explain this, uh, listening to them is actually, if I don't understand it, what is the average person who's not from a minority background, how are they going to understand it? 
and actually Thames Valley have secured those speakers to come and speak at some of our events now to educate our workforce around this. So I think Black History Month has a lot of opportunities, but I absolutely agree with Yvonne. Black History Month is, is almost outdated in that we need to be talking about this all year round. Uh, we can't just focus on it for a month and then forget about it. This is a constant effect of how do we raise this? How do we engage with communities? How do we make sure this conversation doesn't disappear for 11 months and then come back for a month and then disappear again? Mm. So uh, <clears throat> I'm glad you said that, Dennis. And um, so we have two um, issues for the, way, for the way forward, two indications for the way forward, education and a permanent fixture in the national um, discourse. Josh, can I bring you in? And uh, what does Black History Month mean, mean to you? Uh, in, uh, yeah, really, I want to sound like a bit of a broken record because I just echo what the two, the two um, uh, individuals have just said before. I mean, for me personally, um, this is my own view. For me, it doesn't mean a great deal. And I know that sounds quite controversial because I just think it's quite tokenistic, but particularly in the areas that I work in. Um, and we do, a lot of, we do lots of work in schools as well. And, and I just feel that it's... It, yeah, it, it, it's really, it, I find it quite hard to, to, to relate to. And it was, it's, for me, it's kind of cringeworthy. And, it's, and it is because it's almost like that, that kind of, oh, this month we're going to do this and then we'll forget about it for the rest, you know, for the, the rest of the year or for the other 11 months. Um, and that's why I, I kind of pull away from that a little bit. However, some of the people that we work with and some of our clients, it is, it's a huge, offers huge value to, to their lives. Um, and sometimes, you know, because we're supporting some of the people that have actually had all the hope taken out of them for whatever reason. And I think what Black History Month gives to them is, is that hope and that sense of purpose. But for me, for me as an individual um, and the father of three children, uh, three black children, I just, I just think we just need to do as a, as a society a hell of a lot more than just rolling it out one month a year. Mm. So then you are... That, might, that... that sounds quite controversial. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's important to hear different views. Um, we can't be um, sort of uh, very similar in our views. I mean, we are multinational, multicultural, cosmopolitan population. And so uh, everyone has different views. And so we have to be able to listen and take on board other people's views without being contentious or, um, um, you know, um, denying them their, the reality of their views. So we have uh, three takeaways from this, I would say. Education for moving forward, um, a permanent uh, space in terms of the national discourse, and uh, just uh, positive images of the black community and our achievements so that we could be good examples for ourselves and for our children um, for the future. So let's go into the second segment. And this is uh, dealing with the independent scrutiny oversight board um, there's a national board founded, uh, formed and um, chaired by uh, Abimbola Johnson, a uh, barrister um, like myself. Um, I am the chair of the uh, Thames Valley uh, Independent Scrutiny Oversight Board. And our work is very important um, because, as, as I said in the opening of this uh, podcast, we are really trying to strengthen the trust and confidence um, that the black Asian minority ethnic community has in the police. Uh, and Josh, you alluded to the fact that uh, there's a lot of distrust in that area. It's a given fact. Okay, so uh, we are trying to um, ensure and enhance, you know, that strengthening of the trust and confidence that we have in the police. But also importantly, we are ensuring that the police do their jobs effectively because they are here to protect and serve every single citizen, every single resident of this country, and we are all entitled to the equality of treatment. But there's a disproportionality across the board, not only in the police but service, but also across the criminal justice system. And uh, this is something that uh, it, uh, it indicates the, 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 the difficulty of the work that we are going to do over the next two years in Thames Valley. Um, um, because it means changing people's behaviors, um, changing people's attitudes um, uh, from what they did in the past um, to something that's beneficial to 
our community and the, the public at large. And so Dennis, can you tell us why this, uh, this uh, oversight uh, or scrutiny board was, for, was found, founded and uh, the role that you play in terms of uh, um, um, rollout of uh, its implementation? Sure. So I, I, when I came to Thames Valley, uh, the race action plan had just come out and the chief spoke to me and said, look, do, please don't feel like you have an obligation to take this on just because you're an officer from a minority background. And I said, well, actually, I feel like I've got an obligation to take this on. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to be a senior leader in policing uh, and therefore welcome the opportunity to take it on. Uh, but by taking it on, it has to be more than tokenistic words on a piece of paper. It has to be lifted off the page uh, and it has to be open to scrutiny. So we've got the race action plan. Every force in the country has got one. They've put in a really uh, robust scrutiny mechanism for the national plan. And I wanted to be able to demonstrate to the community that we take this plan so seriously that we have replicated the exact same level of scrutiny as the National Race Action Plan. So that means that we would have a barrister who would chair up our meeting. They have a sound knowledge of the law, especially around things like stop and search, use of force, the criminal justice system. And then they would go out and recruit independent members of the community that haven't been picked by the police uh, to form a panel that would then hold to account and advise the Race Action Plan Board to deliver this plan in a meaningful way for the people of Thames Valley. Now, we're the first force in the country to do that. Uh, I've also put us up for what's called icebreaker status. So we know that uh, Section 163 Road Traffic Act stops are regularly claimed by the community to be used as a shortcut to stop and search. Uh, and we've agreed that we will start looking at that to pioneer better ways of working that could be rolled out nationally. Uh, in relation to it. So I just wanted to make sure that A, we didn't just have a plan that was words on paper, uh, that those words were lifted off the page uh, and held to account by, by the community. But also if you look internally, and this is really important because it's not just about external, if we don't get the internal bit right, those people will go out and they will deliver the services in, in a wrong way. And we've seen some of that across the country. And then why would people join us? Now, when I first met Yvonne, uh, my first interaction with Yvonne was where she wrote to me and said, we're not getting this right. And she listed all of the things that she thought we weren't getting right. Uh, and I suspect if Yvonne's honest, she was expecting either not a much of a reply or a quite a defensive response. And I wrote back and said, I agree. Here's why. I agree with this. This is what I'm doing about that. And I broke it down. And she came back to me to say, I can't believe you took the time to write all that response back to me. Well, actually, it's really important that we listen because I've been around for 32 years and policing still hasn't got this right in 32 years. You know, 1983, we had a report. 1993, we had a report. Uh, we've had various critical incidents across the country. Uh, and for the first time ever, this feels much more coordinated and led nationally uh, by the MPCC, by the HMIC, by the College of Policing, uh, and it will be subject to some sort of inspection through the HMIC Peel process where they're building elements of this in. That means if it gets counted in policing, it normally gets done. So I okay. think that's a good thing. I'm really keen that Thames Valley is at the forefront of this, and that's why I'm really glad to have the ISOB on board being chaired by you, Calvin. Well, thank you, Dennis. And it's important to convey to the national community and the Thames Valley community as well, the importance of the, prepare, uh, the, the preparedness of you working with uh, your colleagues like Yvonne to make the necessary changes internally. Um, and we are hoping that that would translate into, you know, a wider sea of change uh, as you and your colleagues interact with the uh, black community or the, the black and Asian minority ethnic community in, in Thames Valley. But I wanted for you to stress to the, to, the, to the public the importance of the tone at the top. Because for me, it was important that your commander, your chief constable, indicate the importance that he attaches to the work that has to be undertaken. And that he would be fully uh, open towards 
independent, tough, tough talking in terms of scrutiny. Um, and so I want you to tell us what, if you can convey the strength of feeling that your boss has for this work that we are about to, to embark on. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I would say that the whole top team are bought into this. They've all agreed to do blogs, uh, both internally and externally, to demonstrate their commitment to this. On the launch of the Independent Scrutiny and Oversight Board, uh, I think the chief met personally with that board to explain his commitment to them uh, and, and to empower them that they, they are working with his agreement that this is exactly what he wants within his force. Now, the chief is going to be retiring in March, but the person taking over is the deputy chief constable of the new chief, who's also equally as brought into this and, and actually led this piece of work before my arrival. Uh, so you've got people that actually get this and understand it. Uh, it, it was interesting that I had a, a chat with, the, with the, uh, what will be the new chief constable, and, and he said, when I came to the force, uh, he saw me make some links with the community that they hadn't been able to get through the door before my arrival. Now, that was because they were able to look inwards and see somebody from a minority background who had come from the same backgrounds as them and succeed. Mm -hmm. And he said it was at that point that he actually fully understood what the benefits of having a diverse workforce was about. Now, for, for a deputy chief constable to say that, and, and make that sort of honest you know, reflection, I think is amazing because you wouldn't have got that in my service before. So I think we've got some really open-minded people. Uh, they're really keen to take this work forward. Uh, actually, they've given me carte blanche. I make the decisions on this and I update them. So I've got nobody you know, pulling the strings in the background. I lead this as somebody that wants to take it forward but they regularly ask me to provide them with updates as to how this is progressing. Um, mm. And actually there will be a level of accountability for me to show that we're delivering this. Uh, and the ISOB yeah. will have direct access to the chief to be able to update whether they think this is going in the right direction or not. And when HMIC come in to inspect us, I guarantee they will ask to speak to the chair of the ISOB to see how we're doing with this. So okay. by having them speak to me there, the force can't back out. Well, that's good to hear. And so we have the tone from the top being set by uh, the, the management team, by your, your, your chief constable. But it's important also that that trickles down to the rank and file. And so I'm hoping, you know, based upon what you've just articulated, that uh, your colleagues throughout the force, throughout all police stations in Thames Valley would embrace this notion for change, this notion for scrutiny um, and hard scrutiny. Um, from the board so that we can bring about the necessary change in terms of their engagement with the police. What I want to share can with I the really Thames Valley community is that um, everyone in Thames Valley is welcome. All of you are welcome to put forward your, your candidacy for becoming a member of the board. Um, we are asking people to submit their, their CVs and my uh, email address is Calvin E.J. Wilson at gmail.com, um, submit your CVs as many of you have done um, already. We are going to scrutinize those uh, CVs and choose from a wide range of skills because we want to have a good range of skill sets so that we can undertake our work efficiently. So no one is barred from, from, uh, from uh, putting forward themselves. I mean, Josh, he works in Devon and Cornwall in Wales and uh, I understand he has some connections with the Thames Valley, and I would say he is open to put forward himself as a candidate. Um, I'm from London, but you know I am the chair of the of the board, and and we are operating in the Thames Valley. So everyone, every organisation, every individual from the Black, Asian, minority, ethnic community, we are all welcome to put forward your view, your your candidacy, and uh, we'll consider them very carefully and uh, choose the best so that we can undertake our work efficiently. I also want to say, apart from the main board, we'll be having an advisory board. And so it means a wider range of people could be involved. And we are particularly looking for, for both boards, um, for young people to be involved, um, because you all are the future. Um, your views are important. 
And so we welcome, this is an open call to all of organizations, all individuals in Thames Valley to put forward your candidacies. I'm sending your CVs to myself. Uh, you can send it through Yvonne and Dennis um, and we can give, give them careful consideration. So you have my utmost commitment to be transparent about that process because we want the best people for the work that we have to undertake. Dennis. Can I just raise a point? Yeah, I just want to raise a point there. Whilst I'm happy to have the application sent to me if people have my address, I and, and Thames Valley Police will not have any part in selecting the people that go on to the panel. It is really important that the panel is independent and that the panel is working with Calvin to maintain that independence and hold us to account and give us advice. Uh, so yes, if, if you want them to come through me as well, and I know I've passed on two that have come to me, uh, that's fine, but all I will be doing is passing them on. Uh, we, I will not be involved in any way in the recruitment of this panel because it needs to be independent. Yes, and just to re-emphasize to you the importance and to the community, the importance of the independence of the board and the independence of the work that we, under we will in undertake. Now, of course, we have to work with the police in Thames Valley, um, right across all the constituencies. Um, but yes, we will maintain our independence because we have to ensure that we, we uh, are successful in the work that we have to undertake. I'm also open because I know some questions were asked during Black History Month as to my contact details. So I'm going to share with you my, my telephone number, my mobile number. It's uh, 0739 393958. And shortly it will be shown across the screen so that we, you, you can contact us, contact me directly, openly. Um, we're here to serve. Uh, we welcome your input. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. We're here to answer them and we will answer them openly and transparently. So we've gone two minutes past, uh, 32 minutes past the hour. And now I think we need to go into the third segment of, uh, of uh, this podcast. And this is uh, the very damning report or interim report from Baroness Casey in terms of her, her review of um, police performance in the metropolitan London area. And it's a very difficult report to read because it highlights things that we've known, you know, for a very long time. But to see them there on paper, um, articulated again, um, based upon what the Baroness and her team saw um, over the review period, <clears throat> It uh, talks about reprehensible conduct by the police in London. Um, not all of them, but uh, it, it, uh, it paints the Met Police in a very dark and difficult light. Um, in fact, the Baroness says the current system is not fit for purpose um, due to the culture in the Met, uh, the lengthy misconduct procedures, um, and the length of time it takes to resolve, you know, misconduct cases. And she also says importantly, this has to be a line in the sand. So it sort of dovetails with the theme of Black History Month in saying, it's a time for change. We must bring about the change and that change is required urgently and that change is required now. But alarmingly, she says there is more to come. So we await the final report in February and to see how much worse um, the Met Police's performance um, has been over the years of the review, but also the months of the re review, sorry, but also um, over the years, because there have been several reports on uh, from the watchdogs um, about uh, um, conduct by the police in, in London. And those reports have been equally alarming. And so it's time for change. And uh, for us in Thames Valley, for us at the uh, Independent Scrutiny Oversight Board, it's important for us to know whether the type of the behavior that's reflected in the report, the interim report by the Baroness, is that re uh, behavior reflected in Thames Valley? Um, 
we have to get to the bottom of this. Of course, we don't want that to, to be the case, but we have to be open, we have to be transparent, uh, we have to be real in terms of what we see. And so, Dennis, can you give any indications as to, you know, what you've seen, if you've read the, the Baroness's report, um, if you've read, you know, uh, the reports from the, the watchdogs, watchdogs over the, over the past year, a few years, and do you think um, that that type of behavior is reflected in the uh, in Thames Valley? Sorry, Calvin, was that a question to me? Yes, it's for you because we want to know what Sorry. we are what we are getting into in terms of you know conduct by the police and engagement you know um, with the black community or BAME community, also internally because. The report speaks to um, misconduct proceedings brought by um, BME uh, staff, uh, how they were treated, how the lengthy time it took for those uh, 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 um, uh, complaints to be uh, um, resolved, um, and, also, and also how the black members of staff or black minority ethnic, um, Asian and minority ethnic staff were treated when they brought these uh, these complaints. Um, so okay. what do you say about whether that type of behavior, the extent of that type of behavior, is re whether it's reflected in the uh, Thames Valley um, police force? Okay, well, I mean, I, 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 can I just make it clear, I, I'm in no way qualified to or commenting on the Met. Uh, mm -hmm. We have invited the Met to attend this meeting, but because of the notice, they, they said they can't, but I think I believe they have agreed to talk to you uh, later down the line uh, in relation to this. I think with Thames Valley, it would be easy for me to say that we don't have those problems. Uh, but actually, the reality is that every force, I think, in the UK has got issues around timeliness of dealing with complaints uh, and dealing with them effectively, both for the community and in relation to people internally who are subject to complaints procedures. Now that might be, it's not helpful if you are someone who is innocent and, and is subject to a complaint. It's not helpful if you're someone who's guilty and you still remain in the police service for an unnecessarily long time because the system is slow and, and, and not at carrying out at pace. What I would say to you is that in Thames Valley, the key elements of some of the findings of the report uh, are featured in the Violence Against Women and Girls work that we're doing it features in the race action plan we have a dedicated lead from the professional standards department who is leading on this work to take the findings from this and other pieces of work to make sure that we never get to the stage where we think we've got a problem uh you know as alluded to in in, in that report now whilst i can never be complacent to say that things aren't, aren't as bad as that, or nobody has come in and scrutinized our department to that level. However, we are doing a lot of self-scrutiny, and actually this, this report is indicative of some of the issues across policing. There's disproportionality in the criminal justice system, there's disproportionality in many of the, the professional standards complaint systems, uh, so this is a piece of work that will be ongoing. What I would say to you is that all of the findings of the report when it comes out in its entirety will be considered by Thames Valley and whether we've got that issue or not uh, and I, I don't think that we have some of the issues that are in that report uh, we will make sure that procedures are in place to regularly health check that they remain not an issue for us and if they are an issue they will be dealt with one of the challenges that we do have like everything is with policing if you ask me have I got enough staff I've never got enough staff. We have to make the best that we can do with the officers and staff that we've got. Uh, but dealing with things more speedily involves having more people. And, and that means taking them away from frontline investigations and things like that. The Deputy Chief Constable oversees professional. He's frozen. Oh, he's frozen. Um, so can I bring in Yvonne? Yvonne, uh, I know this is a delicate issue for you, um, and uh, I know you will be very diplomatic in your answers, 
Um, but I'm asking you to be as open as you possibly can um, in terms of, you know, whether you are seeing anything that rises to the level of uh, what's in Baroness Casey's report, uh, her interim report in terms of, you know, what you see on a day-to-day -day basis in uh, in the police station that you, you where you work or, you know, what you've seen during the course of your career. And uh, I want you to tell us whether you think that there is any opportunity or is there a current opportunity for hoping that things will, will change, that things will improve, that you're seeing a commitment from the top to make things change and you think that your colleagues on the front line will embrace the need for change and, and join hands with you and you know, um, uh, other, uh, other officers in the BAME community to, to really bring about the necessary change that has to, to come about. Uh, Calvin, this is something I've always struggled with, um, being tactful and, you know, those soft skills. These are not skills I naturally, I don't believe I naturally have these skills of being tactful and soft skills and gentle. I'm really blunt and direct and sometimes I'm told I'm uh, aggressive and rude. Um, because when I'm telling the truth, sometimes I just tell the truth as it is, whether it's nice or not, um, it is the truth. So I have had some terrible experiences and I can tell you of colleagues who've had terrible experiences. But then because I'm in the Support Association for Ethnic Minorities and underrepresented officers, of course I would be privy to what goes on more than someone who isn't. Um, so an example is um, a colleague came to work once when the movie Trolls was out with those Trolls dolls. I don't know if you know them with the big crazy hair. And they gave each colleague a different one with different color hair. My one, they colored in with a, with a Sharpie. They colored it in black, the face, and then gave that to me. So that's an example of um, what they call it a microaggression or racism or just banter. Who knows? It's one of those. So things like that happen. Uh, I think I am quite lucky in that I can go to people like uh, the boss, Dennis Murray, uh, and tell him about experiences, what's happening on the ground, because like uh, the boss has just explained, I totally believe that our senior management team, the chief constable and his team, they absolutely get the race agenda. They get it, they're passionate about it, and they're driving things forward, and they believe that. However, I'll be honest and tell you, I don't believe that the sergeant and the inspectors, the, the, the supervisor on the ground, on the front line, the ones who manage me, they don't get it, is what I think. They don't get it. And they don't really care because they're driven by performance, um, staffing issues, resilience issues, being able to deploy officers. So they have different agenda to what Dennis Murray has. I don't know if that makes sense. So while they might get it, the reality is they haven't got the staff and the time to deploy these soft skills. So that's why there's a disconnect between what um, senior management teams say and what actually happens on the ground. When you then look at what happens on the ground, I think in T Thames Valley Police, I think there's less than 20 black officers and I know every one of them is what I think. The boss would give you different figures um, because you know he knows different and we can't agree on these very figures. So while I believe the passion and the drive and the evidence is there, um, and that, because it feels different this time around, and I speak to colleagues. So I emailed every single black officer that I know in TVP and asked them to come and talk about the race action plan and this new, and what, what's going on. And while everyone agrees, this feels different, this feels passionate. There's actually a budget behind this, you know, money, money talks, doesn't it? Not normally, there's no money behind these kinds of things. There's a budget for the Black History Month that we just did. We don't normally have a budget. We did this time around, and the boss paid for it, you know, from the race action plan. So it feels different, and it, it looks different. But there's a lot of people who are thinking, ah, it's just more of the same. We've been around a long time, and there's no change. So uh, I can't answer if there's going to be a difference, but I know it definitely feels different this time around. Sounds positive. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. Um, we have work to do, of course, um, in the areas that you've uh, indicated. Um, and so the tone has been set, as I said, from the top, um, and it has to trickle down. And I think it's uh, in incumbent upon us um, to have direct, constant engagement with those of your colleagues so that they, too, uh, as well, can embrace 
what we are trying to do in, in Thames Valley. Josh, can I bring you in? And uh, you in Wales, um, you have extensive experience with working with the police. Um, you've heard, no doubt, what uh, Baroness Casey said in her interim report. And what say you in terms of what you've seen over the years, um, both in Thames Valley, if you will, as well as in Wales? Um, yeah, so, so I'm, 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 I'm paid. I'm based out in the south, in the southwest, obviously covering covering Wales as well. And my link here is a lot of our, a lot of people that we work with go back to the Thames Valley areas and, so, and surrounding areas. So there's there's my link. Um, so I, I think with with the greatest respect and, and not to you know not to upset anybody, but you know I think we are deluded to think that this isn't an issue. Not maybe to the same extent with every police force in the country. I think I think they've all got their issues. I think the 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 unfortunate thing or the fortunate thing is, or however you want to look at it, is I think it's the Met Police have been under the massive scrutiny. But I think if there was a report done and an investigation done on every single police force in the in the country, I think it would end up some shocking things, um, mm -hmm. and probably just as well for them. It, it it's not happening. I sit on enough panels and I speak to enough people and I support enough to to, to realise that you know there's lots of other police forces that have the that have these issues you know for example in the southwest here so many times i work with people and i'll ask them from your experience from seeing the police the courts to prison how many people looked like you going through the system and so many times people say there wasn't any so straight away that's going to bring up you know and I, was, I was i was quite um quite surprised there about the, the fact that there are only 20 officers that, that the lady knew within the Thames Valley area. I just thought it'd be so many, so many more because that's, that seems the, the underrepresentation is an issue throughout the whole country. Um, and that in itself is, brings issues. You know, how can you relate to those issues? How can you be sympathetic and empathetic to, to the people's issues, their cultures and their backgrounds when there is no rep well, very, very little representation? Um, however, on a positive, it does feel different. I mean, I've been involved with the um, with the anti-racism plan for, for Wales. I've been involved in that and I've fed into that. And some of my clients have fed into that. And it does feel it, something is, it does feel there's some change coming. And, and I haven't felt that for a long time. And I feel that I, I do feel there's some moment, momentum here. And the thing to do with all of this is is to be promoting these conversations and people not to just to take the bat and ball home and, and, and just get upset with everyone and everything, but actually have safe spaces for people to, have to talk, communicate and, 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 and understand the issues, not just to shut the door. And I, and I feel that's happening. So I do feel there is, there is um, a lot to be kind of um, hopeful about. Well, that's good to hear um, because I know you talked about uh, whether other forces could be under scrutiny because of you know what's happening in, in, in the Met Police. But there are six police um, forces that are under special measures, aren't there? Um, and so the watchdog, um, you know, they are looking at what's happening and they're bringing these things to the fore, which is good. I mean, I know some people may say that uh, oh, we've had years and years and years, decades of reports from various you know, um, luminaries across the, uh, the national community, but yet those recommendations and those reports aren't being implemented. Um, but can I think I, as I you say, there's a, a, pardon? Can I just add something? Yes, please. Yeah, and, 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 and also there's this thing around about um, what happens in, you know, the Met is the biggest police force. And, and, and I think it's the ripple effect of what happens in the Met and it is huge. So it's not just a case of what's going on in the Met and the, you know, in those, it's the ripple effect in terms of, you know, the, the other counties and the other regions, because it's, it's that, it's that the media jump on it and then the general public and people are going through the system, whatever it might be, they're all, they all just presume they're going to, they're going to have the same kind of treatment because of the negative press for one of the biggest police forces in the country. And like I said, it's, it, it becomes, it becomes, national news when it's the Met, but things that maybe happen in Wales or, or the Southwest aren't necessarily national news. So people just relate to that. So it's really important that, that, that the Met really kind of get on top of this and get the house in order because it affects so much more than just the Met itself. That's correct. I would agree with that. And also the work that the, uh, the scrutiny boards across the country 
I mean, yes, Thames Valley is the first, you know, of uh, um, the forces around the, the country that, you know, has embraced this plan. We are hoping that the national chair, you know, the conversation that she's having across the board would also generate that type of atmosphere to ensure that, uh, you know, other forces establish similar boards and uh, we can have this constant conversation going with, uh, we, you know, with uh, things that are happening across the board and that, uh, you know, we keep this front and center and um, both in the regions as well as nationally, because uh, the conversation is important. And if we don't have this, these types of conversations in safe spaces, as you indicated, then, uh, you know, we will not make the progress that, that we require. Um, producer, I wonder whether there are people um, who are sharing their views. Um, have you seen any? And uh, um, because we have about nine minutes again, um, it will be good to hear what uh, the, the people, the viewing public are saying so that we can sort of address some of the issues um, at this stage with the remaining time that we have. So maybe, well, Yvonne and, uh, and uh, Dennis, uh, what say you? I mean, Dennis has been in the force for 32 years. Yvonne has said she's okay. been there for 14 years. And so it seems as though they are not giving up at all. So Yvonne and Dennis, why? For me, it's really easy. First? Yeah, thanks, boss. Yeah, definitely. So I get this a lot. And it's because you don't quit. You don't back down. You know, I'm doing this for my children. I'm doing this because it is the right thing to do. That's what drives me in life. I think policing is dead easy because it's simply what's the right thing to do. The right thing is not to give up, is to fight. Yes, I, I don't believe that there are, um, I think, I won't say what I was going to say, that wasn't tactful. There are people with ignorant views. I've got it. It's, it's connected with me, the education thing. Once we educate people and, de and take a dehumanize, because they dehumanize black people. I was watching Dharma and uh, Jeffrey Dharma on Netflix and how triggered I became by watching that. But, you know, how he moves to a black neighborhood and kills gay black men because he knew he wouldn't be uh, scrutinized um, by, his, by white officers. Um, it, it, if you quit and give up, the, um, then th there is no hope. There is no change. I can't wait for someone else to come and do this. I have to do this because it's what is right. Policing is my calling, my vocation, and I'm not giving up on that. I'm, I am religious, and I believe that you know I'm here for a purpose, and that is this is the purpose that I'm here to do. And you know when we were talking about how it feels different, for the first time ever, there is a an ACC, Dennis Murray, who look, who's brown, who's, we don't have a white person calling the shots, telling us what to do. Uh, there's someone for once who's experienced things that I've experienced, who understands the things that I talk to him about. And yes, it's difficult, but there are also some really amazing moments and some amazing white allies out there who empower me and support me. And that's how I remain in the job. That's good to hear. And Dennis, what do you say? Yeah, I, I think this comes right back to what I said uh, previously in that the people that went before me that paved the way have made things easier. Uh, I, I've got to this rank now with 32 years service. If I'm being honest, I think had I been a different person, uh, I would have probably got here a little bit quicker uh, and, and you get some scars and, and a little bit of damage along the way. But actually, I, I maintain that the only way to change this is to get into a position where you've got that level of influence of a policy and strategy to, to change this. And that was the reason that I wanted to climb the ranks. Uh, and and I, I spent 17 years as a PC before I chose to do that. Uh, but actually, having now done that and, and having people saying, well, actually, that's set an example for me, being told that you've got through doors that Thames Valley couldn't get through before, all of those things make it worth it. And, it, and when I leave... I'd like to think that, you know, if, if we can get that diversity through so that everyone has a fair chance, uh, then, then a fair He's frozen. So, Josh, mm -hmm. uh, are you hopeful for the future for, you know, black and Asian and minority ethnic uh, individuals who work in the police, like Yvonne, 
who are having a, a difficult times in terms of advancing in their career, staying on the job, having job satisfaction. Are you hopeful, based upon your experience, that uh, that will continue and uh, things will change for for the future? Yeah, I am. I am. I am hopeful. And I, you know, I, I, I see I see a lot of activity going on, and, I, and I'm really in it. And it really it, it fills me with great joy when I when I when I when I hear people like we have done this evening from from the police in senior roles as well. You know, fighting fighting the fight and. and and that you know that that really gives me a lot of hope, and I, and I and I see and I'm seeing a lot more of those individuals in senior roles now within the, within the police. There's a there's a long long way to go, a hell of a long way to go, but yes. but it's but it's really heartening to see to see people being standed up and being counted. Absolutely, good. And it reminds me another question, please. Yvonne, that's a that's a, a word that you're familiar with. Uh, so you heard the uh, the question. What do you say? And Dennis, perhaps you can intervene after Yvonne uh, addresses the, the question. All right. Uh, so uh, can you repeat again for me, please? The question. Okay. So the question is: If most of the abuse happens at ground level. Why aren't there any more or much more psychometric tests of the frontline force, uh, front frontline officers, in terms of changing behaviour? Yvonne and then Dennis. So I th I don't believe it just happens at ground level. So I know the uh, highest ranking black officer, male officer in TVP, is also uh, and um, abuse happens everywhere. I don't believe it's just ground level, and there is psychometric testing. I've had it several times. I failed it several times, but I've passed mm. it several times as well. Mm. <clears throat> and Dennis, what say you? Yep, I, I think. Uh... Many years ago, they used to do psychometric testing in, in recruits and with some of the things like uplift and for many years now, they haven't had it. I think it's back on the discussion table uh, and, and there are forces that are discussing it. Uh, I don't see it coming in any time soon unless it's mandated nationally. Uh, but uh, it's something that is an option, just, just like now they're talking about things like polygraph testing and, and various things that would help them to rule out uh, some of those rogue elements that have got into mm -hmm. policing. Uh, what I would say is that there is a desire to rid policing of these people that are causing us these issues. Uh, what route they choose to go down is unclear at the moment. Mm. And can I just ask you to address one issue that we talked about when you were frozen, which is uh, the ability of the forces to attract, maintain, uh, you know, BAME or black and eth uh, minority ethnic individuals to the force, have them stay in their jobs over time, like Yvonne and yourself, and have them uh, get uh, job satisfaction for what they do on a daily basis without any of the drama, the prejudices that, uh, that have been revealed in, in, uh, in say, in the net, in the Bar Baroness Casey's report. Dennis, yeah, well, what, what would you say? Sorry, go on, Calvin. Yeah, what will you say about that? And we just have a, a few minutes again, so a minute again. So if you would uh, you share your voice quickly. If you ask me you. to spell out what, how I see this plan being a success, it will be that every person can bring their whole self to work and, and know that they've got the, as good a chance as any to thrive. And that those individuals that come into the organization then transfer that culture into the way it polices its organization uh, and its public so that the public are starting to feel this. There's, there's been comments nationally that uh, policing needs to get away from woke practices. I don't see this as a woke practice. Policing by consent means everybody gets policed by consent, not people uh, and, and factions of the community. So if we can achieve that, then I think we've been successful we've got a long way to go yes indeed and it means also that long road ahead means rooting out you know those rogue elements who bring disgrace uh, to the force and so i'm hoping that the commitment that you've given the commitment that your chief uh, your, your your chief constable has given 
to us as a as a board will trickle to trickle through to the rank and file and that we'll see the progress we will maintain the momentum for um you know that good feeling that things are about to change yes the road ahead is very long but uh, we've started the conversation tonight uh, we hope to continue this work and this conversation you know for the next a few years because this is going to be very difficult to achieve to achieve success you know in this area would be very very long would take a very long time but there's optimism in the air and we are not going to give up as Yvonne said so I want to thank you all Josh Yvonne Dennis for your participation I want to thank our producer Simon um, for the work he's done keeping us together with all the technology uh, we look forward to welcoming you back to the conversation you and the viewing public uh, sometime in the near future thank you and good night Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Okay.